Well, I haven't been on Video Diary for about a week and a half, and um, I felt like some of the things that I was experiencing were probably um, uncomfortable to talk about. Um, I think in the culture of MS, because there's so much of it out there, um, that there is kind of a cultural expectation that it's a rough disease and you just kind of fight it, and a lot of people feel like talking about the um, the real complications that can occur with, with some forms of MS, um, that maybe that is not a, uh, a fighting attitude, um, and that we have to fight the MS constantly, um, and that to really talk about the, the extreme difficulties and the terror even um, that can occur with this disease might be a sign of weakness. Um, certainly when I talk to the MS Society about my right to die activism um, and what happens with people with progressive MS and um, how they advance and ultimately die, uh, they did not want to advocate for, for anything in this discussion because it, it uh, would give a message in the MS community um, of perhaps negativity, I'm not really sure, um, or or anything that would deter from the fighting the MS. We got to fight the MS, right? Um, and certainly anybody with a chronic form of this is, does fight every day, and there's a lot of admiration within that. Um, but I I feel like we we don't really talk about the real. Um, aspects that can come along mentally, cognitively, physically, that, that make this such an isolating disease. Um, so I wrote a message to one of my family members the other day that I intended to start making preparations to go back to Switzerland and utilize their law there. Um, to my knowledge, uh, the Brittany's bill up in Oregon, which would extend the criteria to people with de degenerative illness and right to die, um, that will not even be heard until late 2019 and, and may or may not pass. So I, uh, I don't have that kind of time in terms of um, really being able to survive too much longer with the complications I'm experiencing. I'm having difficulties uh, swallowing when I want to eat and drink. Uh, my diaphragm muscles are getting a lot weaker. The paralysis is surely advancing. Um, and I'm becoming more and more dependent on pain medicines that affect me cognitively. Um, and with some of these opiate medications, they uh, change the receptors in the brain and you over time need more and more to, to um, mitigate the pain, and, and that's surely what's happening. But as I take more and more of the tramadol, uh, the cognitive gets worse, and you know, it's just like so many people with these illnesses talk about. They don't, um, at a certain point, you know, where they can't do many things for themselves, feel like there's a total loss of dignity. And of course, the system we're in really just kind of keeps you trapped in that scenario for years and years until you are hospice eligible. So I told this family member that it had been seven years now from age 33 to 40, roughly, um, that I had had the advanced chronic form of this and had really essentially my existence from day to day is going from couch to bed, bed to couch, and of course I get out for therapist visits and, and physio and all of that, and I, I had been able up until recently to, to travel to a couple of places, but as, essentially the existence has been in the home, homebound, you know, trying to do some little little things on the computer, activism, or, or keeping in touch with the world and, and communication but really, you know, going from my sick bed to the to the living room area and the breakfast nook, and then back to my sick bed, and then to bed. But the bed is never really a place of sleep because it's always an existence to be in the bed. Um, 
it even got to the point where I wake up in the morning and I make my bed knowing that I'll be back in it pretty shortly. Um, but I'll do it in such a way that it becomes more of like a divan or something and I can sit up in the pillows with my, my um, laptop and, and try to have some communication with the world. Um, and I started thinking about that story, uh, I think it's Rip Van Winkle, where he's just like asleep for so many years and then he wakes up and like goes out and sees the world has changed so much. And I, I thought of myself and so many other people who have these chronic illnesses that it's like we go into a different time zone and we're asleep for years and years. Um, and and you know maybe you'd wake up one day and they would have a cure for ms and they could reverse the damage um or wouldn't that be interesting you know uh to to come out of this uh, chronic illness slumber and discover the world had changed so much out there um and i keep thinking about that really um but knowing realistically that my time is very limited in terms of how quickly it's progressing and my level, my threshold for pain and, and really loss of dignity um, and knowing that things are coming to a head. So all the preparations that are going to have to be for, for me to make this international flight to Switzerland and to have some um, ability to interact with these wonderful people um, without being, you know, a total zombie and needing my caregiver, um, knowing that I have to really leave soon. And it all has to do with not being able to get this uh, script for sodium pentobarbital um, or seconal in my own country. Now I'm in New Mexico and we should be legalizing right to die in January for the terminal um, illnesses. Um, and it looks like the other right to die states won't really entertain expanding their criteria, but we'll see what happens in Oregon. So in the meantime, um, I really am just going day to day and week to week and watching um, from a kind of soul perspective, my body shutting down more and my mind becoming more confused. Um, although I'm very clear still that I you know, want to self-determine. Um, now with Alzheimer's, they talk about advanced consent uh, and, and that's a whole other arena and right to die that they're arguing about because potentially the person might change their mind when they're in dementia and they don't want to sway that. But um, I'm all for the idea of advanced consent and um, degenerative illnesses, of course, getting this right and even mental illnesses. Um, I really think if somebody can be clear but but still is suffering from mental illness that they would have the right to to ask for medical aid in dying. Um, I talked to Compassion and Choices and they said that the culture change is not there yet but we're still waiting for this idea to be more accepted, um, to change the criteria to more liberal um, like the Canadians and the Europeans. Um, and and. I mean, I think that to wait for the culture change is not necessarily the right way to go. I think we need to just advocate for it and then the culture change will come and it'll become more accepted. So I spend my days when I can um, sitting up from the sick bed and making phone calls to, to policymakers and sometimes journalists and telling my story um, and seeing what I can do to advocate for this change in the United States. Uh, but I don't think it'll happen in the time frame that I need it to. So uh, there's a lot that I have to get together. I've got to have somebody take me to the plane who um, supports this cause. I've got to have my will in order. Um, I've got to have monies withdrawn and, and uh, I have to turn off my Medicaid because you can't have any money accessible when you're on Medicaid. Um, and then I have to have some way to pay for a caregiver over in Switzerland so I'm not literally flying in, checking into hotel, 
seeing the doctor and then dead within three days. I don't really want to do it that way. I'd like to stay with them for a little bit and, um, you know, uh, interview perhaps with some different people um, and, uh, you know, go out and look at the swans on the lake or the mountains and, and um, see some beautiful countryside. So I've got to afford a caregiver over there and I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but this is kind of where I'm at. Uh, my disease is surely advancing. Um, you know, was I was talking before about how we don't really like to get into graphic detail about some of the struggles with progressive MS. But for me, because it's hit my brain stem and my vagus nerve and the spinal cord so severely, um, I don't digest my food very well. I don't swallow very well. Um, I have a lot of problems breathing, a lot of problems with circulation. And the experience is literally like, um, like my whole spinal cord is melting within my body. It's like it's a candle that's just melting off of the wick. That's, and it feels like that from here to here. So it's not like I have some paresis and then I hit a baseline and I just learn to live with that disability. It's, it's a degenerative, consistently degenerative illness where the whole body is just closing in on itself and it's very, very painful. And I've been living like this for seven years um, and uh, it's just getting worse. So I know there's so many people out there that have these degenerative illnesses and I just hope that we can see the change soon so that medical aid in dying is, is offered to this patient population and that we have a healthier discussion around death and dying and that um, things like family members running away and being scared and people being put in institutions and um, forgotten essentially um, you, you are forgotten in this society when you get sick um, and degenerated if you're not in the rat race and you're not out there competing and performing as a young person, you, you really are uh, shoved away into a different sector of society. And that is a place of real, um, can be real shame for the individual. Um, so I hope, I hope that we see a culture change around that as well. Um, and I'll just continue to keep doing these literary diaries and hopefully they can help somebody. Okay, thank you.